So hey everybody, this is Chris Negline with the Nerd Stravaganza here again. I am with Robert Charles Wilson, a nominated author, an award-winning author, more than you can care to count, especially international, the Hugo as well. And we are here doing a quick interview after he has been at the Broward College campus as part of Humantopia. They have an annual event called uh, the Rites of Spring, and this year was science fiction themed. Yes! And he gave a great little excerpt from his Hugo-winning novel, Spin. So thanks for being with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. So um, Spin was part of a trilogy that also went to, I believe, Texas and Vortex, Vortex after yeah. that. And after that, you've been doing single projects. Is mm -hmm. there a reason for that or just well, I, out I, of the field? I've, I've written mostly standalone novels over the course of my career. Oh. Um, the uh, uh, spin trilogy, or the spin cycle, as I like to call it, uh, was kind of an exception for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure it was the most successful experiment. I think people were a little disappointed with the two sequels that I wrote to that book, uh, in part because I was trying to write books that were different from spin. Um, and that may not have been what people wanted. Uh, but I think that I am happier writing standalone novels, to be honest with you. Uh, I've never been a huge fan of series novels, with some exceptions. Uh, um, trilogies always seem faintly suspicious to me. I think it was Oscar Wilde who said not everyone can write a three-volume novel because it requires a complete ignorance of both art and life. <laughs> um, which is not necessarily true, but it's a wonderful thing to say. Uh, but I like the uh, the closure of a standalone novel. I like the uh, uh, the completeness of it and the succinctness of it. Uh, so that is what I have found myself doing most often. Okay. So, curious, what is it about that you you do when you do your world build your world building? Is, what is, how do you do it? What attracts you to it? You know, it's funny, people talk about world building in science fiction all the time, but it's it's not a, it's a concept that seldom enters my mind. I don't think of what I do as world building, to be honest with you. It's, it's just storytelling. Uh, it's just contextualizing a story and fleshing out a story and populating a story and creating a plausible background for a story. Uh, but I, I've really never felt that there was a separate skill of world building, at least, at least the way I do it. Okay. And uh, it seems like you, you touch on different philosophical themes in your books. Are there any themes you haven't touched on yet that you'd like to? Oh, that sounds like such a pompous thing, doesn't it? The philosophical themes in my books. But, um, uh, you know, as I was saying to the students here today, it's, uh, it's not that I'm searching for a philosophical theme. It's just that there are ideas that fascinate me. Um, and I like to approach them. The thing about philosophical ideas is that they're necessarily speculative. Philosophy isn't a field that produces results. It produces questions, not necessarily answers. But that makes it a playground for a science fiction writer. We do write, uh, as Judith Merrill called it, speculative fiction. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful field for speculation. Um, cosmology fascinated me for a long time. Scientific cosmology uh, which was once a philosophical question that's been uh, uh, overtaken by science. Um, cognitive science fascinates me. I, I think uh, one th I've been reading cognitive science recently, and it strikes me that we're, uh, we may be on the edge of uh, another, that science may be making another, another inroad into the uh, territory of philosophy. Uh, I don't think we have had a really scientific theory of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we've learned a lot more about neurology. But psychology is still kind of mysterious and still kind of uh, resides in the realm of philosophy and speculation. And I don't know what would come of a really profound understanding, a scientific understanding uh, of the human mind, human behavior, and how human beings relate to each other. Uh, that's a theme I kind of approached in uh, The Affinities, uh, my most recent novel. Uh, and I'm currently writing a novel called The Cure, uh, which is uh, in a... In a and to simplify it, it's the, the premise is that someone discovers a cure for uh, the array of disorders we call schizophrenia. 
uh, that uh, turns out to change the mind in other important ways, unexpected ways. Um, so cognitive science has been on my mind uh, lately. Uh, I guess you could talk about <laughs> about my cosmological period and my cognitive period. Uh, um, yeah, those are things. But you know, it, it's not it's not some kind of systematic investigation of philosophical ideas. Really, it's just it's really just the stuff that sticks in my head from from what I've read about subjects that interest me. So that's where you get some of your passion and inspiration is is delving into the research of what's going on in science. Well, yeah, that and, and wondering about the human implications of it, which is which is what a novelist does, exactly. uh, trying to take it down to ground level and give it to, to people like you and me. Uh, that's the fun and the fascination of it. Now, so if I remember with the affinities, it was mostly about technology. And the spin was technology and then kind of went into biology. Would, do you have, uh, lean one way or the other to the fascination of technology or biology? Oh, no, Genetics? no, honestly, no. Uh, um, to me, it's all of a piece. I mean, it's uh, uh, a story will suggest certain technologies, or speculation about certain technologies will suggest a story. It cuts both ways. Uh, it's not something I can predict what's going to what's going to provoke a story from me. Uh, so I can't say there's anything systematic like that going on. Cool. So you have a new story coming out this year, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's called. I have a new novel coming out at the end of this year. Called the title of the novel is Last Year. Mm -hmm. Uh, last year is a time travel story of a sort. Uh, I, I very much did not want to write uh, a time travel story that was about paradoxes, of, um, about the, uh, you know, I, I think as a genre we've explored that aspect of, of time travel. Uh, what I wanted to invent was, invent was a kind of time travel without those kind of consequences. So uh, uh, the premise involves an array of alternate worlds that resemble our past. Uh, which means that in the book, uh, uh, specifically what happens is that a wealthy real estate developer decides, in our day, decides to build a luxury re resort hotel uh, in the America of 1876. Uh, and because there are no paradoxes and no consequences, uh, there's nothing secretive or furtive about it. He announces his presence and he sells tickets. He sells tickets to people who want to visit 1876, and he sells tickets to people from 1876 who want to come to the resort for a glimpse of the wonders of the future. Uh, what I really wanted to do was put two Gilded Ages together, our Gilded Age and their Gilded Age, and watch the sparks fly back and forth. Uh, and it became a wonderful opportunity to put those two worlds together. The two characters involved are a, uh, a young drifter in 1876 who comes to work as a security guard at this resort hotel, which is called the City of Futurity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and he gets uh, caught up in an attempted assassination of Ulysses S. Grant uh, that happens there. Uh, the, the subsequent investigation involves both uh, that character, whose name is Jesse, and uh, a woman from the present who's also working security, uh, uh, a single mom who's also a, a veteran of Afghanistan. Um, and uh, uh, you know, their work takes them to Manhattan of that era, to the Barbary Coast, and exposes them to the kind of, uh, a kind of exploding cultural war between these two periods. The title of the last year refers to uh, the last year that this resort is going to exist there. The idea is that what you are offering people is a glimpse of the authentic past. But the longer this resort exists, the less authentic the past becomes. Uh, so it's only there for a fixed period. And in the last year of its existence, that's when the barrier is totally breached. That's when we, we can say to 1876, well, this is how we live, whether you like it or not. Uh, that's when we can be more informative, when we, can, when we can, for instance, give them some of the medical technology uh, that would save lives in that era. Uh, but it's, it's a very disconcerting look at the future for those people. And uh, it's a very disconcerting look at the actual past for people from our time who idealize that past. Uh, and you throw in gun smuggling, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 drug rings. And, and any, any historical cameos? Uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah, U.S. Grant appears. Uh, um, it doesn't happen on screen, but uh, or on screen. It doesn't happen <laughs> on the page, but uh, uh, 
both Edison and Mark Twain were invited to speak. I was about to say, you said Gilded Age, so I was just waiting for that. (laughs) Yeah, but they're also putting on shows for 1877. They import a Cirque du Soleil show for people, and there's a... There's a series of uh, introduction to cinema movies for people who've never seen a movie before. <laughs> it was so much fun inventing what goes on at this resort hotel. That was part of the pleasure for me. I can, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. <laughs> well, we're uh, a little pressed for time, so we're going to wrap up. This is a little shorter episode than usual. But thank you again for checking us out at the Nerd Extravaganza podcast and our YouTube. Don't forget our sponsor, the Adventure Game Store. And thank you again, sir. It was a You're pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs>